Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Good Question. Today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, but it's really all just about goodness, truth, usefulness, which is actually what life is all about, and we're going to discuss that through uh, whatever means you provide. Thanks for hanging out. My name is Curtis Childs, and I'll be your host. Do you ever get the feeling that someone is right next to you on screen and has been this whole time? <laughs> this is Cara Dom, Latin consultant for the New Century Edition, Hi, and I just uh, love having you here on the panel with us. And it gets even better. To, my, to, to her left, we have Chris Dunn, who is community manager. And then to his left, we got Chelsea Odener. Hello. Who is a writer for Swedenborgian Life. Thanks, everybody. I uh, wouldn't, wouldn't want to talk about this stuff with anyone else, so appreciate you all <laughs> being here. For all of you if, you, if you like this at all, please please like it in real life. By that, I mean click like, click subscribe, and click the bell uh, to make sure that people see this and that you support us and you know when we're putting something new out. Okay, so the, how the game is played is you guys in the chat right now ask questions, and we don't know what's coming, and we're going to do our best to think this stuff through from yep. a Swedenborgian perspective in real time, and and uh, hopefully we can just start to get the um, the vibe, as they call it. Okay, yeah. so let's uh, let's see what um what are you thinking about? What's going on? Do we have a question? Did anyone show up today? All right, yeah. MTP three five eight asks, ooh. what did Swedenborg have to say about the Sermon on the Mount, aka the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. which is a great sermon, by the way. Um, <laughs> and the and in Swedenborg, <laughs> in Swedenborg land that that's several books you're talking about i mean to, to <laughs> expound the whole inner sense or, or what that means uh is a lot yeah. do we have does anyone have any insights In, unless i'm totally mistaken about this we're talking about blessed are the poor blessed are the meek yeah you yeah. got so, it you got it what do they but then have? that's just one part of it yeah that, that's right? part of the sermon on the mount there's a yeah. lot of different parts but dare yeah. i say that's like the part everyone in the audience is waiting for right i mean i, mean, I think good. so they just so, named it so any any thoughts on that thing uh how many of you, Chelsea? Do you have a the um, I did there? I did give some thought to the specific one that says um, the meek shall inherit the earth, I believe, and um, and again, I guess this is true of all of them, but you know, you sort of take it through the lens of correspondences. So I don't know, you know, I'd have to do a search to see if Swedenborg specifically remarks on any of them. I think he does, but. But you can also sort of read it just through the lens of correspondence as far as like thinking about what the earth is and meekness is like humility and um, and so inheriting the earth. I'm trying to remember what any insight like now I'm thinking yeah. about it fresh right now, which is probably fine. That's but, what we're here for. Yeah, that's what we're here for. Um, but just uh, the earth can be your um, outer self, your lower, the outer part of yourself. So you could think of it being that um, the, uh, I wanna say resurrection of that, but really it's like that, um, the humility or sort of that process of regeneration, how that actually makes you uh, regenerate your outer self, I guess is what I wanna say. Sure. Like, like inheriting that is like, yes, the rebirth or something. That you're not just like, I'm gonna, we're gonna transcend and get rid of this this outer outer part of us or the lowest part that the cool thing about regeneration is you know we're gonna it's gonna become an inclusive whole and that mm -hmm. thing's gonna finally yeah. serve its its purpose yeah um did I ever, you guys ever tell you the joke that uh it's about that part of the oh know? i've def i actually have definitely heard it okay. yes <laughs> then, then I haven't. probably yeah. people are, on probably home have heard it okay it. okay so um and uh, okay so really quickly um so one, one day jesus comes back to, to earth and and he says hey everybody all right all the cool people and all the rich people come on up with me to heaven and everyone who's left is like but wait you, you said that the meek would inherit the oh <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It really so, is a play on like you the, know you think the, the earth, the, the it's kingdom of heaven or something. It's a strange like, oh, thing the to earth. say. Like yeah, it's a strange thing. And it's so, like wait, I thought the losers were getting the earth. Right. The winners were getting like whatever. I don't know. So, well, another thing in Swedenborg usually that the earth represents is the church. Mm. So yeah. that's uh, another way you could look at it is mm -hmm. like if you're in true humility, you're you are open enough to be able to receive. Yeah. The good yes. truth of the church. Yeah, mm. yeah. And there's this whole uh, spiritual interpretation of each of those conditions that you can find yourself in, where it sounds like, in the the literal sense of the, the beatitudes, that people who've had hard things happen to them are going to have it really good. That 
th that's the message. But all of these conditions have this sort of spiritual analog that have to do with um, some shade of humility, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. that, that the poor, I think at one point Swedenborg defines that you're spiritually poor if you don't believe that anything of good and truth really comes from yourself. That, that if, you, if you thought, oh, all these insights I have, all, all this ability, even the ability to be conscious and, and reason and all that is generated out of me and therefore I can look at mine as opposed to the next person's and mm -hmm. look at how much better mine is, that that's sort of the, the negative sense of spiritually rich. So the poor is this state, the particular state of humility, and if the thing you're, you're coming into is the kingdom of heaven or that the the state of mind that is heaven these are really he's giving you that the this is the things you need to to believe in and live and then you'll you'll get there so it just to me yeah. goes from what's so okay so i just don't get the moral equation okay i get it that you had a hard time in the world but to, that so that's all the requirements to then have things go well for you and why'd you do that to him in the first place to me it, it sorts it out a lot into being this instruction guide to us that's something more than just get rid of your money so that you can inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's so much of that uh, imagery about the heaven coming down to earth or righteousness raining down from heaven and bringing or causing righteousness to spring up in the earth. So this like, like you were saying, the receiving of the earth of what is of heaven and then having a thriving, you know, mm -hmm. ecosystem or something from mm -hmm. that. and. It'd be interesting to study the other Beatitudes because I know like there's the one about um, being persecuted. And so how that mm -hmm. how that also speaks to that process of of what we have to go through to have that alignment be happening in us, you know, and mm. get get the earth to be that fruitful soil. What mm. what else is in Sermon on the Mount? Does even, oh, there's uh, like, so, so many. It's the one where it talks about don't worry about oh. tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. <laughs> Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Uh, the sparrow. Yeah, yeah. which is part of that. Well, that I means there's a whole show, uh, there's, couple shows we've yeah, done yeah, about yeah. The, yeah. the care for the morrow. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, we have a, a short clip uh, specifically about that. The Swedenborg's book, Divine Providence, is essentially expounding on that concept. But Chris, did you mm. want to offer thoughts? No, I mean, the only thing I, I am reminded of when I hear conversations like these, and it's we had a few conversations this morning in our community chat about them on YouTube, the yeah. fact that we could even say that there is a deeper level that is timeless about this sermon and about any story in the Word yeah. is revolutionary. So I uh, <laughs> yeah. just to, to have this conversation seems like a really uh, big blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well that, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, just like, what did Swedenborg have to say about the Sermon on the Mount? It does make me think like that, you know, every Jesus said, I speak in parables, you know, mm. and, and so that everything he did say has all this deeper level of meaning that is that relates to a living relationship with the divine in us right now, you know. Yeah. And yeah. what I've, what the correspondence just does, it, it marries the, the love and wisdom. Because hearing, even though I just now was asking, what what's in it? Like, I don't remember, but I've read it many times. Mm -hmm. And in the, like, that's one of the more moving parts of the Bible. Just the, the concepts, but also the just the order that they come in and how it moves. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a little work of art. But it's a work of art that you could go to and, and not quite understand what you're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. You can get some things, but what, what was he saying about the, the poor and, and how does this help? But with the correspondence, it, it's, it's this beautiful thing that, that stirs your heart, but also gives you really insightful information and freeing instructions into the human condition that anyone anywhere can apply regardless of external circumstances. That just, like you're saying, revolutionizes mm -hmm. yep. something that was already good, all right? We're, <laughs> yep. It's not broke, we're just fixing it more. <laughs> can, I, can I just say one more thing, yeah. just yeah. sort of about logistics, about how Swedenborg approaches some of the stuff. Um, so in The Secrets of Heaven, he does like a verse by verse description of the inner meaning of all of Genesis and Exodus. And then yes. in Apocalypse Revealed, he does the same thing for the book of Revelation. But he doesn't do that for the rest of the Bible. So the, you right. won't find a place where he's verse by verse going through the Sermon on the Mount and explaining it. Right. Um, but bits and pieces of it will come up if he's talking about the meek or the, the poor yeah. or the earth. Then the, the quotes from it will come up as he's explaining yeah. these sort like of overriding concepts. Mm. So I just wanted to say yeah. that out loud totally. because people might not be sure how it is that he um, right. breaks down the Bible. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you got to trust her on that because she consulted <laughs> the Latin for the entire Secrets of Heaven or is very close to have. So um, she knows what's in there and what's not. Okay, <laughs> yep. let's take another question. Thanks so much for that one. Our next question comes to us courtesy of Jan 
who, sa- who asks, why does man seem to resist a belief in God yet readily embraces hmm. scientific beliefs? So, yeah, particularly hmm. now, wh- why are we uh, on YouTube having... Well, actually, I'm going to push back on that just slightly because I was going to say... Look, why are we on YouTube having to say, there is God, here's where there's God, but nobody has to say science is real, but they do. There's a lot of (laughs) things. You find a lot of scientists that are out there saying, listen to what we're saying Mm -hmm. about how we uh, believe the world works. But okay, so I have a couple of thoughts on this, but I'd love to hear Mm. you guys. What's what's the difference in the way these kinds of information are, are talked about? And what's the difference? What does it mean to believe in God versus believing in science? Right? I mean, are those two things, they're really the, the same, but uh, yeah, what's up? Uh, well, the first yeah. thing that comes to my mind is that human beings living in this world are sense-oriented. Mm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> keywords. <laughs> yeah, upcoming programming. Uh, we, all we have is our senses, right? The input that's coming through our ears and our eyes and our nose and all that is the only thing that, oh! <laughs> okay, so no tapping on the desk. A, we're not supposed to bang on the desk. Our, our producer Stuart is very upset about that. He's very upset right now. It's live TV, though. Things oh, happen. Things right? happen. Okay. But yeah, the solid things that we can believe on in, I mean, science is yeah. something that we can see and that we can that our senses will verify for us, which is not quite the case with God. Like right. unless you make that leap that that beautiful nature or something, it's still a leap in your head that that nature is evidence of God or something like mm-hmm. that. It's not quite the same as, um, well, yeah, I can taste that, so I know that it's yeah. strawberry flavored. Mm. Or, I, yeah. I, I think uh, reliability of access. I often think, what what's the difference between spiritual sort of stuff and physical stuff, which science is just applying the scientific method to physical stuff. Well, you can only apply the scientific method because we can all access the physical world all the time, and it's it's all the same. The, the spiritual stuff that people re- report, even if it's really real to them, and I believe people when they're saying it, something like a near-death experience, you, you most people can't turn it on and off and can't re- direct themselves a- as, as clearly and precisely, and even if they can, don't have a direct way to say, look at my results, whereas mm-hmm. in, in doing something in the physical world, you can, you can teach people how to do the same experiment and they'll definitely see it for themselves, mm-hmm. whereas we don't understand the, the mechanics of the spiritual stuff enough to, if everybody could do a simple 30-minute meditation that would get you into something mm-hmm. state and then go look, go over the mountains and you'll see a, a, a temple, then I think we could start to get some of that precision. Mm. Um, so anyway. Yeah. I Kind of what I was thinking about in reading this question is um, kind of God's role in this. Like he, he respects us enough to not force himself on any one of us, yeah. mm-hmm. which to me sets up the conditions where we can actually think uh, in favor of God, think against him, or not cho- you choose not to believe in him versus other things. Uh, it's a testimony to just how much he appreciates our freedom to navigate these things and, and not be a slave to him. Um, yeah. So that's, I, I think that's, and it, if you can see it from that angle, I think it's a remarkable gift. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, a sort of a technical answer, but I think Swedenborg does get fairly technical about these things, <laughs> is like, he writes about how God, everything God does is from the innermost to the outermost, and then back from the outermost to the innermost. And so I think about like our, the, our life cycle, and when we're children, we have this access to this innocence and this like high level, you know, this um, spirit in us. And Swedenborg writes that children, everything is sort of alive and divine to them. You know, like kids are way more readily to just accept like that this divine transcendence thing exists, you know, and like because their dolls are alive to them, like everything is just Mm -hmm. sort of this spiritful thing. Um, But then as we grow up, we our minds come further and further down to being more and more focused just Mm -hmm. on the natural world. And we just it's the process for us to sort of lose that access and get more outward focused like because Mm -hmm. of the freedom you're describing for us to be able to develop ourselves as individuals to then be able to make that climb again to use our knowledge of the outermost world. Like so many times in the Bible, people, um, you know, uh, they have to go to Egypt and then come out again. Mm. And Egypt is this 
it corresponds to that knowledges, these scientific beliefs and everything like that serves this essential function to ready the outermost part of us to be able to start to have an actual um, reciprocal relationship with God. Whereas like when we're a kid, it's just like, everything's alive and I can't think about myself, but you know, I'm just being. And then when we've grown through adulthood, then we start to have a, a one-to-one, you know, partnership mm. with God. And that's that, um, you know, climbing back up and opening up to that higher level. So I think that's like a, just a natural phase of that outward orientation to uh, have to work at it a little bit. Yeah, and and what about, um, there's so many ways you could take this question, but what about history? If I think about what's, if you think about religion as sort of the device that's the ambassador of ideas about God to the human race on a large scale, and how's religion doing versus how's science doing? Like what, which is producing results and in and, and which way does the arc of history seem to be moving? You know, we have, you look at um, areas that have been ruled really tightly by religion. I, mean, I think Europe is sort of this example that we're kind of feeling the after effects of is there was this Christian str- stranglehold on everything, that mm-hmm. everything went through Christianity and that's how it worked. But it wasn't like Europe was thriving and, and innovating. And but as soon as the Enlightenment comes along, around Swedenborg's time, and they start to question that and break apart these religious structures, all these amazing technological miracles start to go. So it certainly seems like well, science is producing these results, and religious institutions uh, did, not, did not seem to be bringing out the same kind of innovation, the same kind of useful stuff to people. And all, all the major religious institutions, or at least I'm thinking of the Christian ones now, are embroiled in all kinds of scandals. Mm-hmm. So it's just like a PR thing of like, wait a second, who's doing more for me? The, mm. the science and, and the religion and, you know, like Galileo. And obviously he was on to something and the Catholic Church was in not hearing it, but they were wrong. And so mm-hmm. they, how much of that can you do before people say, well, baby with the bathwater, there must not yeah. be God because God's been so poorly represented. Mm. And I yeah. think that's that like, for a lot of people you know history plays into it but that in itself is a means of like because you had that breakdown then it means people are studying the material for themselves or doing you know like is this true for me like what is true about it not just what those people told me to swallow you know how is this alive in my life so i feel like even as a result you know there was a book that was published years ago called god is dead or i mean that whole idea of like god is dead religion doesn't matter anymore you know but that's just actually not true you know like people are finding religion still Mm -hmm. matters or the whole spiritual but not religious thing is like it seems like that's actually healthier for a lot of people even though we're having to find ways of you know supporting um spiritual community but you really are getting these much more personally alive religious or spiritual experiences of like people um, having truth come alive in their life from whatever avenue it is from, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. sort of maybe more genuine than than just the like, oh yeah, they told me to believe it, so I do that. I think it's I think it's going to make a comeback. I mean, I, I think that r- religion. Yeah, I think the new form that you're alluding to, which is, yeah, people are actually searching for this and finding something real in, you know, on their own personal quest, you know, in community with others. But I think that's going to eventually, we're going to be producing results. And as we upgrade sort of our source material, I, I think Swedenborg would be the, a prime example of this, of the ideas in there are so strong that I think you're going to start to see religion solving problems systematically. You know, like you think about the, the way that science can solve. I was just watching this documentary about how they're trying to eradicate polio and how much you got to work at that and and, and get these vaccines out to try to do that. But uh, I think you could start to see stuff like that coming out of of religion and and more religion or spirituality or whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. in more and more systematic ways where you're really, even people who are out who say, I don't really believe in that stuff are benefiting from the the advances that are being made. I I think there's a a 2.0 for for the whole spirituality thing on the horizon. Uh, Okay, so there's a couple of different ways to think about it, Jan. Thanks thanks for the question. Let's, Let's do more. Let's do another one. Carrie Parsons asks, how do evil spirits know what we love or care about if they aren't very aware of us? So, mm. Swedenborg has this idea that the heaven and hell are right around us. We, Our consciousness is a citizen of the world that we all go into after we die. There are people who become very focused on good, people who come, become very focused on evil. They're called, both called spirits, which means, I'm just giving the background for the spirits, which means a person who's moved on. So he says, evil spirits 
can be, there's some passages where he's describing experiences where he seems to be having hell directly attacking what he cares about or loves. But on the other hand, he talks about that it's not just that spirits know exactly what's going on with this. So how do you reconcile those two or did they catch us? Mm. You know, do we have an inconsistent uh, worldview? <laughs> yeah. So. Well, I mean, it does seem that kind of love is the, the glue of all things in the spiritual world that... Uh, what we what we love we that love is kind of like a black hole that sucks other people towards us and um with evil spirits in with angels uh it's kind of like the system is laid out so that whatever specific things we have an affection for and we delight in those things are what draw automatically in a sense the communities of evil spirits that also uh kind of delight in those similar things um so it's just it's part of the design that we that like attracts like um, in a good sense and in a bad sense right mm -hmm. yeah he'll use like auras to describe that mm -hmm. kind of influence where we're all we all have an aura of our really the substance of the spiritual world which is love and wisdom and so that uh that aura can serve to enable that ability so that somebody with a resonant aura will be drawn close to you or or be uh you know sort of pushed away by it or something and i think um, that there's also the idea that evil carries with it its own punishment. So these evil spirits, they, they, Swedenborg says they're protected from knowing there's a human being right here that you could destroy, you know, or like that you could sort of go at. Um, yeah. They're not aware like that, but they're like, if it's that emotion of, you know, fear or something, like mm -hmm. the thoughts and feelings that are associated with that on the evil spirit side is just naturally comes with its own, like really it's kind of like the thoughts that arise from fear are their own punishment, you know, <laughs> like who likes to just be like sort of riddled with those. And so that just sort of lends itself to our minds, even if the evil spirits aren't, aren't aware of like the transmission that's going on. Right. Um, yeah, Cara, yeah. do you uh, have anything? I don't. Good, okay. Um, I, have, I, have, I have one thing, two things, one was, there's some passage somewhere. You're just gonna have to trust me on this. I think I remember Karin talking about it. He's another writer on the show. And she is saying that Swedenborg once saw this crowd of evil spirits around a something. And the something was obscure. You couldn't really tell what it was, but Swedenborg learned it was a person. The, the spirits maybe didn't even know. They just know it's a feeding frenzy, but they might not know that there's a particular person in there. Um, but the other thing I would say is, how, how do evil spirits know what we love or care about if they aren't very aware of us? The answer is something really weird. It's probably something really with a strange spiritual structure to it. I know that Swedenborg talks a lot about uh, evil, we have angels and evil spirits who walk with us in our lives very closely that, that tap into the good and negative things in us and that the evil spirits come to see our stuff, they think it's theirs so that they'll almost adopt a persona, not, not of us, I don't know exactly how that translates, but that, that whatever we love that's negative, they think they love it as well and that's a protection so that they won't attack us because they think it's ours, but could it be in, this, in the, the instance of temptations where we are being, our loves are being assaulted is that evil spirit being attacked by other evil spirits right. that are going, I don't know, it's going to be something very complicated and very weird sounding to us, but but there's a mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay. I really hope these uh, our responses are helpful <laughs> <laughs> to Gary Parsons. Let yeah. us know. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. And our, so this is the eternal question is, are people coming here because they want like a perfect answer or do they just want to chat about it? Yep. I'm hoping it's it's that B. one because we're definitely, <laughs> we do that without fail. And, and, yes. and we, we appreciate you uh, continuing to, to bring us these helps. things. And I think I like that. I like that, um, you know, it's something you've got to ponder and, and turn over in your mind. That's That's mm -hmm. how this would be, even if we were very smart scientists talking about physical stuff, there'd be a limit to the edge of our knowledge and we would be, uh, I can talk about this here, but I don't know what in, in speculating yeah. about that. So we should be speculating here. And too. one thing I want to throw in is that like that I, I felt like I'm trying to hear what we're saying as we're saying it, you know, as I'm thinking about it. And I feel like imagining what how it might land with people. And one of the things is like, Ugh, like, I don't like that idea of what if I can't control what I love and it's just like this evil spirit magnet mm -hmm. and I'm like suffering like this stinks. Um, and that's why Swedenborg says, um, reflection is such a core essential part of our minds and like a gift that we're given through our rationality, which is our ability to reflect on our 
experiences and through that reflection we gain a freedom you know like in a distance from not necessarily yeah um like from what is arising within us so even if we feel like we're caught up in some what we would call mm. evil or even if it is just you know fear or you know some kind of depressive thought or whatever it's like our ability to reflect on that is what makes it so we can see oh this is just arising within me it's not me you know we it loses that power over us to say this is who you are like that's what sort of that's how the evil spirits can get at us as they can you know the power of that to convince us that that's who we are when mm. really there's there's always a freedom in our mind to be a, a witness to our experience and then you know um, Swedenborg describes like you can see see what the evil see what the evil is that's there and then just you know tell it to go back to the hell from which it came or whatever there's various mm -hmm. ways that he says that but so that that there's always no matter even Swedenborg himself wrote about how he would just be completely have so many evils kicked up in himself but they had no power over him because they they weren't him and he could see that mm -hmm. yeah so. and that's that's a gift that evil spirits give you Right, even though yeah. they're not trying to do you any favors, but divine providence is arranging yeah. something so that nothing is happening to any of us that's not trying to, or, or, or succeeding in some way to work to better our condition, our eternal condition. So yeah. I just know from experience, if I never had, if I never uh, so I had suffered the consequences or the implications of my beliefs for the negative things I love through, through just having to live out the chaos that they cause, I would never let go of them because it's just like, well, these are working fine for me. It's yeah. only when I, you enter these states of, of um, you're, you're spiraling down in something that, that you get the gift of feeling, well, I don't even want to feel so possessive and competitive and, and whatever it is, I just, I, I, I want out. And, mm -hmm. and that I think is not that I'm tying stuff back in, but isn't this like becoming spiritually meek, becoming spiritually poor is to be able to say, there, there's an inherent state that we start in, which is I so love the idea uh, this is may not maybe not uh, like blatant in everyone, but I so love the idea of being really awesome and being better than other people that I I want to maintain the matrix of ownership in uh, in stuff because mm, it, right. it it leaves that potential that that I can be if if we all have a certain value I could be better. But as you as you real start to you know, get knocked around by the storms of life, it then becomes like well actually I I'd rather just we all get along. You know I I really feel that in, in myself. Yeah. So mm. so yes, you're, I was just thinking how you mentioned Chelsea. How are people taking this at home and nothing there's no evil spirit stuff that's just that's chaos and they're they're attacking right. you and making it worse this is all little does hell know this is all part of a very tight system that's working in the end for for everyone's benefit and and more and more benefit the more we're willing to allow mm -hmm. providence to, to work this stuff okay nice all right um Kerry, thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> guess what, guys? We are just about at the halfway, so we're going to stop. Just kidding. We're going to keep going because it's only halfway. But the only way that we can keep going, not in this episode, but overall as a channel, is if you're all willing to support what we do. This is a not-for-profit. Believe it or not, major corporate sponsors don't really want to sponsor a uh, <laughs> conversation about how the evil spirits attack. Unless it? yours does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call. Yeah, right, right, right. So um, here's, a, here's a, just a really quick clip about how you can help make this possible. We want the ideas and insights we cover to be available for free to anyone, anytime they need them. As a nonprofit, we depend on donor support to enable us to continue creating high quality programming. This season, we're featuring the opportunity to become a member of our community of sustaining supporters by signing up to give a monthly donation. If you've benefited from our content, please consider going to otlemonthly.cosbox.com to join the central network of people in the world who make our work possible. Our sustaining supporters are the backbone of what we do at Off the Left Eye. Your support helps the ideas in our content reach and nourish thousands of people every week around the globe. We couldn't do it without you. Give if you can, receive if you need. If we cycle through this way, in the end, everybody wins. Thank you. Let's get to the next question. Okay, so here's the next thing we're going to talk about. It comes to us courtesy of Dave Collins, who asks, Swedenborg said, all power belongs to good and none to evil. How is it that evil does, not, does seem to have... A lot of power. This is no. This is proof that we're having good conversations. Yeah, right. Because, because people are coming across this system that 
Swedenborg describes of how the world works, and they're weighing it in their minds and trying to say, okay, how, how can I get it to be more and more satisfying? And so this is a point. Let's open this up and see what we can. And this is two, this ver- two very important pillars in, in the worldview is this idea that all power belongs to good and none to evil goes with what we were just saying about how everything that seems negative is serving some kind of purpose. But don't go around telling me that evil doesn't have power because evil is basically running my life and everybody else's life and the world is such a problem. So so how are you going to reconcile these two? I think I'll let you guys handle this one and I'll <laughs> step out for a minute. Yeah. But this is, this is, this is, we got we to gotta think about this. So I, did, I think I'm tapping on the table. Okay, so who, who wants to... To give that a shot. Well, if I start with thoughts, then maybe you guys can save save it. But <laughs> <laughs> rather than have me sour it all, the you'll, end. you'll lay down <laughs> on the wire. <laughs> um, so what's coming to me is like uh, Swedenborg talks about how like God, well, and belongs to good. So God is goodness itself, love itself, life itself, and yet needs to create something outside of itself that it can have a relationship with for the sake of joy and love. And so Swedenborg describes that like the material world, us as these little finite self consciousnesses are inherently dead. So similarly, it'd be a hard case to sell that like, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, I'm dead, Ooh, yeah. you know, always have been. Swedenborg also says that- <laughs> How was your day at work? Yeah, my coworkers uh, still dead. dead, you know, <laughs> but, um, but like uh, that, um, he also has a great line that I love because it just like hurts her brain to hear it where he says like when we when we realize that we don't uh, like that that all life comes from the Lord and like letting the Lord actually rule in our lives and so we let go of our like self efforting this idea of like I need to accomplish all yeah. this stuff that's when we first start to live like there's this potential for life that is through receiving life from the Lord um, and so that's just to say like, it's all evil is, is a part of that whole experience of just believing our finite, exp- the, the illusion and lots of traditions talk about this, you know, like there's, um, Mara in the Eastern tradition of just, or just the whole idea that like this world is illusion or something. Right. It's like, obviously it's real. We can do scientific experiments on it, yeah. everything, but there is this, um, the the appearance is that uh, our our finite existence of the way things seem that I'm this autonomous being that has no connection to a divine life source and it's a fend for yourself world that we live in and all this stuff that um, really does seem to have power but it's not actually the source of life which is which is um, from God and even Swedenborg says like the spiritual world and has is even more alive than our experience in this natural world yeah. um so i guess that's just starters yeah awesome. starter thoughts it's a great starting point yeah okay so w- where do we want to go from there Oof. i just uh there's a passage that i think about when i think about questions like these uh at swedenborg's description of an a-, a single angel uh dispersing like tens of thousands of evil demons by simply being uh, in the presence of those evil demons. And that doesn't really seem to answer this question exactly, but what it shows me is that while it may very well be that my pain or my suffering or whatever I'm dealing with uh, is real, it feels real, it is real, the power and the hope that comes through a blueprint like what Swedenborg offers us is totally uh, what is the real deal? What is going mm-hmm. to actually, in the end, uh, unite us to the source of love and completely obliterate, if we let him work through us, uh, all of that crap? Yeah. So maybe maybe we're not in that good, which evil has no power against yet, mm-hmm. um, but you, you can get to a state where, yeah, nobody can nobody can touch you. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, do you want to go next or do you want me to go next? I, I want to go next because okay. I don't have good thoughts, but I have some thoughts. <laughs> you mean your thoughts don't have any power? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about how Swedenborg says that we're all born with inclinations to evil every time, There's of every kind. There's some kind of heredity that we have. And uh, I have a beloved elder in my life who 
just can't get that word evil about herself or all yeah. the people that she loves. It's harsh. But whenever she reads evil, she t she she um, substitutes the word selfish, and then she totally gets it. Mm. Um, and so I'm just thinking about how, like, little kids, I have a toddler, grandchild, and man, oh man, when she wants what she wants, she wants it, and yeah. she feels very strongly there's a lot of power behind what she wants to satisfy her own desires. Yeah. And, and I'm just translating that into the human race at large, like, we just come so totally self-absorbed that's how we we start right. um so i don't know somehow that's just yeah so that's the baseline uh, we're, and we're also filled with god's love and right. god's life but uh that's a lot to overcome i mean a lot to sort of deal with and figure out how to order those loves about having the love of self be in the right place underneath love to God and love to the neighbor and mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and little kids are great, but also very evil. <laughs> like, we couldn't act like they act <laughs> and get away with it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm thinking about what's power? Where Swedenborg said all power belongs to good and none. What is actually power? And you can't square this equation without the thought that we never stop living. Right? We, we are eternally alive. So... Mm -hmm. In the end, what's power? The only power that's, if everything that's temporary is basically nothing, because even if something lasts 40 years, if you're going to live into infinity, 40 years is, is gone. You never remember that it was there. So I, the way that I can read that evil doesn't have any power is that evil, um, mm. this, this suffering, uh, or the things evil is trying to accomplish don't happen. The things good wants to accomplish do happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about in us, when, when, when we hear that the spirit of this question, how it evil seems to have a lot of power, is what I'm assuming is it's like, well, you can be living your life and somebody driven by evil motive can come and attack you and, and, and basically ruin your sense of safety for the rest of your life or, or for the next four decades or whatever. Seems like evil has a lot of power, but if we're talking about divine providence ma making it so that actually the eternal effects of anything that happens end up mm -hmm. tending towards good. That whatever journey we get put on that evil thinks, look at that, it's really got us and it's, it's messing us up and it's causing us suffering, but that God through providence is actually making it so that, that, that what we're learning and, and what, how that's freeing us from our own love of self mm -hmm. or whatever makes it so that in eternity we're going to be happier our, our state of happy, eternal happiness is that that much higher. There's no ratio. In the end, so much more good is going to mm -hmm. come. That, that what evil, the very thing evil was hoping to accomplish, which is I'm going to make you less happy. In the end, you've made us infinitely more happy. So in in that mm -hmm. way, sure, sure, evil can do things, but nothing that evil does lasts like it wants to. And the things that the goodness does are permanent. So mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. that's one way that mm -hmm. I would that I would address what that's I think great. the spirit of that question is um but yeah. it's great to get all everyone's thoughts on it because this is the thing this is the thing that you gotta wrestle with and how can you square life with a divine plan and to me you've got to add eternity you know mm -hmm. the equation yeah and it, make, it makes me think of um or just a couple other thoughts one is that uh we had uh sherry i think was her name Ein, and talking about the the that's a lie tool to like mm -hmm. the the thoughts that evil spirits would spark in her mind or whatever and right. just being able to say like that's a lie you know, mm. that you eventually wear down that sense of like, evil does seem to have a lot of power and that's the only power it has is to seem to like mm. it has a lot of power. Mm. <laughs> like that's all it can ever do. Mm. And, mm. Um, but when you learn that that's all it's capable of doing, then, um, then there's ways to get to see beyond it. You know, it's casting mm. large shadows and um, another way somebody told me is like, evil spirits never talk in full sentences, you know, like you just, just yeah. try to find the end. What's your point? You know, or yeah. something like, where are you going with this? Right. Like they're just sort of like, <laughs> like who will be scared? Cause this yeah. is going to happen or so like, but it's true that we can get, they don't even have to finish their sentences. It gets us so ratcheted up that we're ready to go, you know, defend ourselves against the invaders and you know, whatever that, um, but that's, that's all just, they can seem to have power, but mm. Not yeah, really there. Right. That if you if you examine, or if I examine my own fears and and, and stuff that I would feel like is from hell, if you really put it under a microscope, 
especially if you put somebody else's, if you, like your friend is telling you what's worrying them, you can yeah. very mm. easily see like his ridiculously irrational. Like, mm. n- and not like you're criticizing them, but but seeing it as like a fear system, like a propaganda system against them, you can see like the yeah. hell is bringing stuff that would not stand up to any, would not stand up in court, and they they right. they thrive mm. on you not really being able to examine it because it's so emotionally charged. Yes. So I totally see what you're Especially saying. Especially if you're holding on to a truth, like you were saying, like any truth of divine providence these like spiritual truths that Swedenborg says are so important is like believing like there is a God who is nothing but love and loves you you know so you hold that truth up of like I am loved and there's nothing that can affect that then like how does that evil you know impact that truth there's no there's no competition Mm. right so mm-hmm. there we go, and even some tools in there, like just saying what Chelsea said as a little mantra, you know, can mm-hmm. can can uh, start to show the lack of power that, that evil has, even though it seems like it does. Thanks, Dave. That's a great mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Good question. Let's mm-hmm. do the next Good one. Uh, this is, I always want to say great question, but <laughs> Pete, the name of the show. Yeah, <laughs> Pete. Da- Good Good question is a better name for a show, though I think. Pete Dawson <laughs> asks, what happens mm-hmm. when the child and parent pass at the same time? Do they stay together even if the parent isn't ready for heaven? Oh, mm, we never got that question. question. I know, I've never been asked We never that got question. that one before. <laughs> I don't, you know, we, we've never gotten the very specific form of any of these other questions, but I don't think we've ever had this introduced to us. So I'll, I guess I feel like I need to set up context in case not everyone's familiar with every little bit of Swedenborg, but of course everyone is. Just kidding. So <laughs> you have this idea that, you know, we go to the, go to the spiritual world. Swedenborg says that, Little kids go right to heaven because they don't have the same. They they're cared for in that environment. They develop in that environment. They don't have the same life baggage to work through, and they haven't made the potential evils in them actual evils. So they go right up. But we need to work out things and can spend longer in the world of spirits. What if you know, say you're in a car accident or something, and the whole family passes at once? Don't they get to stay together? I don't know. This is going to be pure speculation, but let's do it with gusto and, <laughs> and with principles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Principled gusto. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I was just reading in Heaven and Hell today. Uh, there was a number that talked about there's how. There's so many numbers. Yeah, That's there's so many numbers, but one of them yeah. spoke about how quickly people are reunited with loved ones. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, the particular passage just suggested that. Um, you know, if, no matter where you end up, uh, just a little bit more context as we continue this, um, doesn't matter if, if a loved one is in heaven or hell, or no, no matter where they are, these reunions take place when you cross over. Um, people can meet you in a state that you can receive them, and, and it's a beautiful kind of meeting place. Um, if someone, like a child and a parent, pass, while the processes may be a little different initially, I would imagine very, very quickly that coming together would happen. Yeah. Um, just because it's just the the way the Lord has that system set up. Um, right. Yeah, awesome. and I think I think a, a principle within that that is just interesting to think about because I think we do think of um, heaven as being like, okay, you've made it, you stay there, hell, you know, you're down there, you made it or whatever. But just that you're, it is, po- sounds like from what Swedenborg says, spiritual states people can change state all the time and so therefore be in another part of the spiritual world even if their core self is still rooted wherever their spiritual home is and so that ability to um, change state even even though children go to heaven a fascinating story Swedenborg says is like children grow up in heaven but they're not angels yet they get to live there it's a great place to live Um, (laughs) but they they have to develop their selfhood just the same as anybody else and so they actually can they go through a process or he gives one example so you sort of generalize from this that when they come of age in heaven they have to go through they change state and they actually will be removed from the heavenly space that they're in and go through a semblance of an experience of having their kinds of inherited evils get kicked up so that they can process them and sort of go through it's weird that he says this a kind of spiritual growth but obviously Mm. A different level than what we go through down here because they're not not in such an extent that they succumb to evil and they, and they could end up in hell because sure. that's not possible there but that um it's enough that they hone who they are their sense of self so that then they can find their spiritual home in heaven so that's just to say 
also with time, you know, people can just spend probably epic amount of time together in the spiritual world. Yeah. As long as it needs to be for people to figure out for themselves what what's going to happen next. Right. Mm. Yeah, and um we talk about heaven you can hear Sweden where use that term and you think of it's oh it's just a big place and it's over there there's heaven but heaven is actually scattered around in the midst of he talks about different elevations are being higher heavens on top of a mountain and then lower heavens in the middle and then hell right below it and it's not just there's one boundary and then everything from here on is heaven it's all like there's a level of integration there and also the entering heaven Sweden works as you know, children go into heaven but I'm we're talking about a billion, 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 billion people do this, and there's got to be so much variation in how it's done, and and how do you get heaven there? It could be that, let's say, parent has a lot of processing to do, kid, but you don't want to, to separate them. It could, can it be that they're, you're in some kind of house that you stay in, and the, the kid has, like, some sort of angelic babysitters that are with them some of the time? <laughs> like, there's, there's, that, that world is more nuanced and vibrant and alive, and you think about the workarounds we can get here. There's got to be something <laughs> that can mm-hmm. go there, which I don't. I don't know if I said any principles. Oh, I said one about how it's integrated. <laughs> yeah. there, there was gusto. Go. Very principled. Oh. Very gus- gusto. Very yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My gusto principle is that uh, God is love, and somehow the compassion and the safety level, the level of safety for parent and child here, yeah. um, is going to be you know taken care of yeah. somehow i don't know mm-hmm. awesome mm-hmm. all right well let's let's leave it there thanks so much pete for the question is anybody else daring to ask a question to us <laughs> let's see this the answer comes now well, our next question is carolyn blake who asks hey mm-hmm. does pr- uh, and this is cool because we're covering such a wide spectrum of, of spiritually kind of stuff you know um going from wondering about the, con- the conditions to how can we reach out to other people? Does praying for people actually help them? And uh, this gets into a lot of different things, but I, I won't preface this one too much. Does it work? Do you guys do it? What, what's the deal? Well, prayer is great, right? I mean, it's uh, in and of <laughs> itself, it's I, uh, it's an awesome thing. I, I used to be a Catholic, and I used to pray uh, to help uh, help people through the intercession of saints and all these things yeah. and um, you know one of the things that really struck me when I was starting to come into Swedenborg's teachings was this idea of you know if just because we pray for someone um, that that prayer doesn't necessarily have the power to change someone's life or their circumstances um, because God's already trying to figure that out for that other person anyway. Yeah. Like we, we talked in another question about God's always trying to set up our eternal lives for the best possible outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so whether or not we uh, pray to that person that's struggling or not, those conditions are already happening. And they're not not happening because we don't yes, pray right. for them. Yeah. Um, and God's but, not like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so that's... Reminder, Chris. Yeah, that's... Re- <laughs> So in a sense, that's really comforting, you know. That's, uh, but at the same time, prayer uh, gives you an intention, and that intention is powerful. If you have an intention to, that someone uh, finds healing, and you let that be a part of the way you live your life outside of that prayer, um, that could be a very just powerful spiritual practice. So I don't want to discount yeah. praying for people, but I don't think that just because you pray to have them be helped or saved or whatever it is that you're praying for. That doesn't warrant anything different on God's end, which is that he's got all this stuff going on for that person's benefit. Right, right. Oh, and that's, so you, so you, yes, it definitely clearly outlines sort of the two sides of it here. So I, I like that. And other, uh, other thoughts? Yeah, just similarly, I guess, along the lines of what divine providence is and that it is in the smallest details of all, Swedenborg says, and it's, and it's, in everything all the time and so um when you know it's and and yet the whole experience of life is that we are getting to live as if of ourselves you know with this sort of the the satisfaction that comes from the sense of personal agency you know and our ability to be having this um these relationships and you know just um life with god and everything and so um, 
so it's just one of those interesting things that like sh it's probably a, it would be a part of providence if i'm feeling inspired to pray for somebody um especially if you're praying with somebody that helps a lot mm -hmm. you know like if you're you know mm -hmm. physically like that has a real i guess that that's even a good point that like when you're with somebody and you're praying for them that feels huge. It's like such a gift to have somebody do something mm. on your behalf or like just to like just that act of love is so meaningful. And so that that kind of, you know, Swedenborg says that thought brings presence in the spiritual world and love creates union. So like that's real spiritual power that you've got going on if you're thinking of somebody with love and with this sort of intention of wanting to support them in their life, but Obviously, if you're having that good thought, that's the Lord inspiring you to do that for that person. Even if you're, you yourself are the one that was like, oh yeah, I really wanna, you know, Kara, mm -hmm. I wanna help her, I wanna wish her well or something. Yeah. Like any love that we have is from the Lord anyway. So there's like, the Lord is just running the whole thing to, to get us to love each other. Yeah. <laughs> and and nice. so our praying for other people, I think it helps, helps that come into being. Mm -hmm. Please help Kara wear a gray shirt. Like the rest of it. <laughs> she, we, really, we really needed we her to did wear it. That. I mean, we did it, so yeah. we can't say. Yeah. If we had, yeah. next time. That's great. We'll test it. Cara, do you have uh, something you want to say uh, about? Well, <clears throat> I had a friend with a <clears throat> who um, had a child struggling with cancer, and she was very, very clear that all our prayers, and we just had a big a uh, bunch of friends and classmates that were praying for her all the time and she was very very clear that that made a difference mm -hmm. and and if love is the most substantial thing that's what Swedenborg says love is the substance um, then something about that is good and powerful and our, our desire to um, just like if we're praying for somebody across the world just our desire to have that person and the Lord like getting together and working things out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. It just, I don't know if it actually helps them, but yeah. I think it helps the world that there are people praying for other people. Yes. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> well, I think, and it's, so, I think we sort of have both. And I mean, the, the point that Chris was making is I think the thing that, that I definitely would say is not true is there is an idea out there that <clears throat> and I, and it's either implied but some people maybe are really doing it from this that right that, that god is relatively indifferent and needs to be urged into mm. caring for some of mm. us or or praying for a particular thing to happen like that, that god wouldn't have thought of that i i do think it's important to, to say that no i don't I don't think that that's true. I think that God is always trying to do what's right. But I think at the same time, you could have that prayer can make a difference. Swedenborg talks about it making a difference for you because it's opening you up in humility to the idea that God exists and, and God mm -hmm. can do things. But yeah, everything works through means. So just like I can affect somebody's physical life by going over and helping them move, that actually really does something for them. You know, can can I I'm putting effort into something that's that's more non physical or spiritual? Does it does it work? I think about all these. We're just doing these shows about how when we read the Bible, that does something for angels. That creates conditions up there. Is could it be that even if we're if if we're praying for somebody, that creates some kind of trajectory that angels can then use? Yeah, there could be a million mm -hmm. again weird sounding ways that that does do something, but. Yeah, so it's it's like both. It's not how it's traditionally been cast, but yeah, there could well be the praying is doing something because mm -hmm. because why else is there so much um, seeming experience with it it mattering? It's just it's just about why why it matters and why you're doing it so that it doesn't degrade the picture of God that we have, but yet mm -hmm. does uphold this this idea yeah. that somebody can we can help each other and extend love in meaningful ways and right when you understand those core principles of like who what got who god is and and the divine action that's present in the world then then you can understand how praying might help others you know yeah. but if you have a sort of confused and cut off sense of an unloving god or something then mm. the whole praying 
the idea that praying to help others could end up just further confusing that whole mess or something. And another thought of the um, the humility that's involved, where like mm-hmm. if you're if you're praying, like what you're saying, that perhaps just sets up an individual's mind conditions to be to be available to be sort of um, nudged by divine providence to act in some way to mm-hmm. help yeah. to help others if it comes about, you know, like so we can have intentions and then surrender it to to the will of divine providence or like right. I'm using that synonymously with God, you know, like just mm-hmm. God's will. And right. so there's always that element to it. I'm just listening to a book uh, that's talking about how how just how much the presence of other people affects us psychologically that that negative people really make you more negative positive people really make you more positive so the boundaries between one individual and another could mm. could very well be more fluid and, and who knows mm. what we can do i want to do one more question before uh-huh, the end right. of this show so let's just get this next one Thanks, and Caroline. really give it the old uh whatever you give a question john wager <laughs> asks does swedenborg say anything about the now or holy moment mm. the fact that there is only a constant unfolding of the moment if time is an arrow then we're constantly dancing on the tip mm. so Lovely. what i think we're talking about here is the present right yes. uh, do, is there is that relevant you know and that that's a huge deal in a lot of traditions is there any relevance to where swedenborg describes that the the where wisdom starts to teach us uh, about what life is. Does the present matter? Is, are we supposed to dwell in the past? What, what, what's going on? Mm-hmm. He does talk about the angels. Um, they have no concern about the past and they have no worry about the future and that they are in the present at all times and that's why angels are happy beings. Yeah, right. that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> right. he also says that and yet they have this full, not like the past and the present are somehow like, I mean, the mm-hmm. past and the future are sort of fully in the present mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Like, it's not that they're lacking something. There's like a richness to that present. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that even scaled up to God all the time is simultaneous. He, he says that a, a, yeah. in a few, that, that God is looking at now as always. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think one, uh, one important thought that has come into my head is the fact that now is super critical but at the same time um divine providence is often in hindsight so yeah uh you, we can see and feel gratitude for the way in which god is leading us through looking back on our day or back on chapters of our lives and saying holy smokes like, that was a beautiful moment in my life where that clicked or i met that person and we something you know whatever it was so uh i think yeah stressing about the future can do serious harm but uh, but holding the past and gleaning from it the experiences in which the divine has touched you is right. also kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. kind of cool is a great place to leave it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I would say if time is an arrow that we're constantly dancing on the yeah. tip, Swedenborg would say it's more there's this spiral. He's always talking about mm. these spirals, and so we're always at the edge of that mm. ever spiraling, you know, mm-hmm. divine life thing. Right, man. That makes me want to say more things. Okay. <laughs> well, well, we do have a few. We do, yeah. We have a minute or two here that we wouldn't want to not use. Uh, <laughs> m- m- there, there does seem to be this interesting interplay between what's come before, even in the ideal angelic state, and and that, that at times, at times, uh, all of our old memory and stuff goes dormant, and we barely know it's there. But at other times, Swedenborg says people are brought back into every state that they've ever experienced. And this is sort of maybe like a life review or that you go back in the state, there is a cyclical spiraling yeah, nature cycles, to things. And, yeah. That it's, it's this, yes, you're supposed, you think about where you are and this is where we actually are, but there is this sort of homage and and com- composite nature of mm. of uh, the, the, the present um, being enriched, as you're saying, by the past and the future. So yeah, it's all about now, but in this cool way, God has arranged it so that the now can really extend beyond into what has mm-hmm. ha, was the now at some point. Mm. Was it worth it? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so worth it. Yeah. So good. <laughs> so coming. Hey, hey, hey. Before I talk about anything that's coming up, like and subscribe. If you didn't already do it, you can really do it. And, and um, now is the time to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so coming up this week, 
we we as you can tell we love what we're talking about here and we could talk about it forever maybe for some of you it feels like we have been talking about the it. eternal <laughs> present and it, it threw out the into like, the into a pretty long internal present <laughs> what's co- we're, we're not going to stop this week we're going to come at you with a lot of really cool programming we have our show news from heaven which is going to have two episodes this week we're going to dig into on thursday how angels become leaders look we talked about the mindset of an angel and how that brings you all this happiness how do they take that and channel that into doing something useful for the human race is great and then on saturday we have a show entitled believe it or not the inhabitants of hell are sense oriented what could that possibly mean and how do we (laughs) steer clear of ourselves being a part of that mindset then the short clips you we asked you answered we continue with our hell theme here (laughs) which i know some people are like why are we so help focused well you know it's just, it's just we, we did get that hell sponsorship. Who governs hell? <laughs> is there suffering in hell? These are important questions to round out the worldview. Those will be our two short clips on Wednesday and Friday, respectively. And next Monday, we're going to take a look at the why is everything, a cellular blueprint for life. And this is how mm-hmm. the categories of love in us, how, what, why we're doing what we're doing, can drastically change how happy we are and how much we're tapping into heaven and how we can look at motivation as the key for untangling the web of the mind. The following Monday, as if that wasn't enough, oh, we'll just dig into the meaning of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know that passage in the Bible that everybody gets all stirred up about. What does Swedenborg (laughs) say about that? We talked about Sermon on the Mount today. What about something that's not as beautiful as that? What does it mean and how does it apply to our life? So that's what's coming up. And we hope to see you all there. Thanks so much, everyone, for um, being willing to chat about this today. Thanks, Curtis. And thanks to all of you for asking questions and, and making it happen and going through this whole journey with us. We'll see you soon.